Okay, welcome to the Neuroethics Learning Collaborative lecture on brain stimulation. Today we're very lucky to have Roy Hamilton as our teacher. Um, Roy is on the faculty in neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he did his training both here at Penn, uh, residency and fellowship in cognitive neurology, and before that um, at these little lesser institutions in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard Medical School, Harvard College, and MIT. Um, Roy's work um, mainly focuses on brain stimulation um, as a tool for studying uh, brain plasticity, um, the process of recovery and cognitive rehabilitation after brain injury, and um, lately he's begun to delve into some of the ethical and social implications of this work as well. So we're very happy to have him uh, here uh, leading us for this lecture. Um, I should also mention he's co-director of the laboratory for um, cognition and neural stimulation here at Penn. So I give you Roy, thank you. Great. Uh, it's really great to have this opportunity to talk about some of the, uh, the larger implications of non-invasive brain stimulation. I find I spend most of my time administering brain stimulation. And it's refreshing to take uh, a moment to step back and think about what some of the, the broader ramifications of this technology might be, uh, both presently and in the future. So uh, today's talk will be better living through brain stimulation. Maybe that should be followed by a question mark. The promise and the peril of TMS and TDCS, and by that I mean transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial direct current stimulation in the age of cosmetic neurology. Here's our roadmap for today. So many of you aren't that familiar with TMS or TDCS. So I take a few minutes just to talk about these two technologies. So first, a primer. Then we'll talk about the promise of these two technologies. And today, I'll focus specifically on experiments that uh, demonstrate that these two kinds of technology can be used to enhance cognition potentially in normal, healthy individuals. I spend most of my time working with uh, patients with stroke, trying to enhance their, their recovery. But we'll talk today about investigations in normal individuals where cognitive capacities have been enhanced. And in that uh, vein, we'll talk about cognitive enhancement, mood enhancement, Manip and manipulation of social cognition, uh, which is a very interesting area, especially when we think about the ethics of brain stimulation. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the, the perils, the larger perils of brain stimulation and what, that, that, uh, what the implications there might be. So first, obviously, when you're talking about any kind of technology that, uh, that has potentially therapeutic or enhancement uh, uh, capacities or capabilities, you have to talk about safety. Then we'll talk about uh, issues of character. We'll talk about uh, justice, the, the equal distribution of technologies. And we'll talk about autonomy, the ability to choose what you want to happen to you. So first, a word about transcranial magnetic stimulation. The underlying concept, and is, it, is everyone here at least a little bit, who's heard of this technology before in practice? Okay, great. So uh, the concept behind it is really quite straightforward. It's uh, in fact uh, over 100 years old. It was discovered by uh, Michael Faraday, and that idea is the idea of electromagnetic induction. So if you have a coil of wire and you pass electricity through it, what will happen is that the passage of that current through wire will create a rapidly fluxing magnetic field. If you have a second set of wires that are close to, but not necessarily touching the first wire, the induction of the rapidly fluxing magnetic field actually generates current in that second set of wires without having to physically contact them. That's called induction at a distance. And so this is the basic principle that we use for transcranial magnetic stimulation. We have a coil. Uh, we induce a rapidly fluxing magnetic field, and the neurons underneath act as your distant wires, right? They are the, the bodies in which current is generated, thus uh, leading to depolarization and firing of neurons and uh, changes in, in cortical function. Importantly, uh, just to reiterate, this is non-invasive. We don't have to cut anyone open. We don't have to drill any burr holes. You know, all this is happening outside the head, and it's focal. Now, the shape of your coil determines the focality of it. But if you use the most commonly used coil in cognitive neuroscience and in therapy, which is a figure eight coil, about yay big, the, the resolution, the spatial resolution, is on the order of about a centimeter by a centimeter on the cortical surface. Also, importantly, 
for most purposes, for most experimental purposes, it's rapidly reversible. So you administer a brief uh, stimulation. The effects you see usually wear off, although we'll talk about situations in which uh, the, the effects can be more enduring. So here's uh, basically what it looks like to administer TMS. Uh, in our laboratory, we have subjects uh, sit in a, a frame. They have localizers that track the position of their head, the position of the coil. And then there's a, uh, an infrared camera that actually uh, perceives where they are in the, the space of our laboratory. And we use that data correlated with previously obtained MRI data to target our stimulation. Just a word about TDCS. So if the principle underlying TMS was simple, the principle underlying TDCS is possibly even more simple. It basically is the application of weak electrical current to two electrodes. Right? You take two electrodes, you place them on two different locations, um, at least one of them over the site that you're interested in stimulating. Another one uh, we often refer to as a reference electrode, so it can either be in a different location on the head or off the head or in some experiments off the body altogether. Uh, and you run current through it. The current is very weak, equivalent to what you might get out of a 9-volt battery. And the mechanism here is a little bit different. If we think that TMS depolarizes groups of neurons. What we think happens with TDCS is that there is an alteration in the probability of firing of, of uh, groups of neurons. So uh, depending on the polarity of the uh, electrode that you're using, you can use a, an anodal, uh, an anodal uh, electrode, which has a positive effect or an upregulation on the likelihood of firing of assemblies of neurons, or a cathode, which tends to have a negative effect, uh, sort of downplays or dampens down the likelihood of firing of neuronal assemblies. <coughs> And if TMS is a uh, relatively safe technology, TDCS is incredibly safe. In fact, no one to date has ever demonstrated any adverse effects uh, in response to TDCS, although it is a more recently introduced technology. All right, so just a little word. We're, we're going to spend most of our time talking about the, um, the enhancement potential for these two technologies. But I, I did want to take a moment to talk about the investigative potential of these two technologies and why they're becoming so popular in cognitive neuroscience. So what I'm showing here, you can think of as a, a sort of space by uh, time by thought map in terms of investigational tools, where on the y-axis is the temporal resolution of an investigative technology. On the x-axis is the spatial resolution of an investigative technology. And sort of coming into and out of the board is whether or not the technologies are correlative. In other words, you're observing one phenomenon, you're observing another phenomenon in your technology and pairing them together and say these, saying these two things are related, or causative. So inferentially, you're, you're, you do something, and after you do it, you note a change in behavior or some neuro neurophysiologic property. Right? Does that make sense to you? So in that framework, most studies, um, including imaging studies, which are sort of this turquoise box here, uh, EEG, ERP, MEG, they all sort of fall in the correlative end. We're observing a change. We're observing some behavior and seeing if they match up. Whereas technologies like TMS, and uh, unfortunately this this article sort of predates TDCS coming into sort of common use, so it doesn't have a TDCS box, tends to be inferential in nature. You're doing something to the nervous system and observing what the effect is. Right? TMS has a spatial resolution on the order of centimeters, as we discussed. So on this spatial scale, it would be maps and columns rather than whole brain. And has a temporal resolution of seconds and milliseconds. TDCS, if I had to draw it on here, would uh, have a slightly larger or uh, more grainy spatial resolution, and uh, maybe on the order of column, or sorry, closer this way, between maps and brain, and, uh, and a slightly longer temporal resolution on the hours of minutes to, uh, well, to hours. So we can talk about TMS and TDCS and what they do. So for TMS, there are different categories of manipulation that we're talking about. Where um, we could talk about neurostimulation and uh, depolarization. So you can talk about enhancing or uh, actually depolarizing assemblies of neurons. You can also talk about neuromodulation, sort of uh, ad uh, administering TMS in sub-threshold or in lower uh, intensities than what is required to actually depolarize neurons and then observing subsequent effects. For TDCS, remember, you're not administering a, a brief pulse. You're, you're modulating the probability of firing. So here we're talking about neuromodulation. And importantly, with both of these technologies, you can talk about two different kinds of manipulation. One, 
inhibition of cortical function, right, sort of adding uh, noise or interference to the system that actually gets in the way of the pursuit of some behavior or, or uh, cognitive activity, or facilitation, the ability to actually ramp up the activity of assembly of neurons that actually has a salutary effect on the behavior in question. So when you talk about TMS, especially in terms of studies, a, a term you hear thrown around a lot is the virtual lesion. Uh, the idea that you can use non-invasive brain stimulation to temporarily down-regulate the activity of a region that you are trying to interrogate with respect to some cognitive function. Right? And so I just want to take one more moment to talk about why this is a valuable technique um, in terms of some of the advantages that it has over, for example, classical lesion studies. So first of all, uh, in classical lesion studies, one of the confounds is that you're often studying these people years after their, their lesion. And so you don't know what degree of how they're manifesting or how they're presenting represents their acute deficit and what it represents um, the reorganization of neural pathways in response to that deficit. So you avoid that confound when you stimulate acutely. Acute studies, and again, sort of related to that, acute studies minimize this plastic reorganization and avoid the confounds of other pathological processes that might be going on at the same time in brains. Also, uh, because you have this technology, you can repeat studies in the same subject, and in multiple subjects, you can make the same manipulation, which is often a problem in lesion studies where people have, you know, patients have varied pathologies and varied presentations. So there are a number of advantages. Don't read this entire table. The only reason I put it here is just to summarize some of the, uh, the differences between TMS and TDCS. I'll just run through them. The temporal resolution of TMS is on the order of milliseconds. The pulses are very short of TDCS minutes. The spatial resolution, we're, we're really talking about less, you know, within a centimeter for TMS and on the order of centimeters for TDCS. The duration of TMS, if you administer it repeatedly, and this is something we haven't talked about, if you administer it repeatedly, there are studies that demonstrate <laughs> benefits that can last for patients weeks to months or longer after repeated stimulation, and we just don't know yet with TDCS. It's really a uh, very precise localization that you are able to achieve with TMS, whereas with TDCS, you don't tend to use these, this frame the stereotaxy. The, the, the electrodes are, are rather large. They're five to seven, so you're really aiming at, at larger sections of the brain. Uh, in terms of safety, there are pu well-published guidelines for TMS, but we'll talk about TMS and safety in a bit. For TDCS, I'll emphasize again that no one's ever demonstrated any adverse uh, effects. There's a little bit of discomfort with either of the procedures. With TMS, you can get some facial twitching because you stimulate the muscles over you know, the, the peripheral musculature as well. With TDCS, there tends to be something of an itching, kind of annoying feeling under the electrode. Again, not intolerable. Um, with T DCS in particular, you have the capacity to do really good sham controlled studies where you can administer TDCS in a way that uh, makes it hard to distinguish real conditions from, being, uh, from fake stimulation. Uh, I was, uh, it, because it's raining, I didn't do this. I was going to bring my TDCS unit. It's, it's only about yay big, just to emphasize the portability of it. You know, two electrodes come out and they're little pads like that. Um, however, I didn't want to, to get it wet today. So, uh, and then, it's, uh, it's TDCS, I want to emphasize, is quite cost effective. It runs about $10,000, which is going to come up later when we talk about some of the, the ethical implications. All right, so let's talk about the ways in which TMS and TDCS have been used beneficially in normal subjects to enhance aspects of cognition. So here, uh, we'll talk about language, learning and memory, spatial attention, problem solving, and then what at least one investigator has referred to as savant skills. I feel like I can't really talk about this subject without talking about um, Alan Snyder and some of his claims. So for language, there are a number of studies now in the literature that demonstrate that, that transcranial magnetic stimulation and direct current stimulation can be used to enhance different components of language. Right? So uh, TMS and TDCS have been used to enhance naming speed. Uh, they've been used to enhance the acquisition of novel names. So you teach people nonsense words, and you link them to, to objects or nonsense shapes. And then uh, you can actually demonstrate that you can learn these novel names faster with TDCS. Um, TDCS has also been used for better acquisition of grammar. And I, I chose to focus on that study here in this illustration, where uh, s subjects were basically taught a new grammatical scheme with uh, obviously novel fake words and, and new rules. Of course, they weren't told the rules. They had to sort of learn the rules implicitly going through a, a training task. And what they found was that after stimulation during the acquisition phase for their, their new grammar, 
they were better able, and you can see here, I don't know if this comes out very clearly, but they were stimulated over Broca's area. Okay, this is anodal stimulation over Broca's area. They're better able to catch non-grammatical items in this new grammar after being uh, trained in conjunction with TDCS. So the reason why I like this is because it immediately made me think of uh, all those teaching commercial, you know, language learning commercials. You know, so you want to learn a new language, try our system. And you can imagine, so you want to learn a new language, you know, wear your thinking cap and, and uh, zap away, and you'll be able to tell correct grammar from incorrect grammar. Um, also, TDCS has been shown to uh, increase verbal fluency. So um, continue with a smorgasbord of non-invasive brain stimulation studies. Uh, and I only have time to just give you glimpses and examples of, of ones that I really like. Uh, in respect to, with respect to learning and memory, TMS has been shown to enhance phonological memory. So in a task where subjects were taught to distinguish or trying to distinguish words that sound very similar from e uh, to each other uh, phonologically, it turns out that normally it's harder to remember words that are phonologically closer to one another. And what they were able to discover was that using TMS actually enhanced the ability to remember distinctions more clearly. Um, also, TMS and TDCS have been used uh, in a number of studies, actually, to enhance acquisition of motor skills. Uh, in particular, a number of these studies looked at stimulating over one hemisphere and then uh, noting an improvement in the acquisition of motor learning or the performance of a motor task in the hand on that, on that same hemisphere, if the ipsilateral hemisphere. And it's been used to sort of inform theories of interhemispheric inter interactions and how the two hemispheres play with one another and inhibit one another or, or activate one another. And then uh, one study I focused on here is TMS used, or sorry, TDCS used to improve verbal working memory. So this is a task, this is a, a three back task. So the subject is shown strings of letters Right? And their job is to decide on a sort of continuous basis, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the NBAC task, whether or not the letter that appears appeared three letters ago. Right? So you have to sort of hold this in your, your working memory. And what they demonstrated was that uh, you could use TDCS uh, over the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and that you could actually enhance um, the ability to remember uh, in this NBAC task. And so what you see here is sham TDCS or fake TDCS compared to an active electrode, an anodal electrode. TMS and TDCS have also been used to enhance spatial attention. Now, the literature here, I think, isn't as rich. So I just focused on one study that's uh, a fairly well-known study in this area from a few years back in which 600 pulses of 1 hertz TMS were applied over either of the parietal cortices, left or right. Uh, and one of the effects, the, the expected effect, was that uh, extinction, which is the failure to perceive double simultaneous stimuli. Neglect patients get this a lot. You, uh, you show them one stimulus on, on their good side, they're OK. And if it's a, a stimulus on their bad side, if they have very mild symptoms, they might be OK. You show them two stimuli, and they sort of default to the good one. They just ignore the other one. So that's extinction, right? And so they were able to induce extinction, uh, which is what they expected. But what they didn't expect is that they actually had an increase in learning on the ipsilateral side, again, sort of akin to the motor learning I was telling you about. Uh, and so this has been used as, as part of a, a growing argument that's been made about the, the nature of the two hemispheres, how they interact with one another, and how you can actually, in some cases, uh, increase learning or increase the function of one hemisphere by inhibiting the other. But the point here is that TMS was used, at least in this instance, to increase target detection, increase visual spatial processing for the ipsilateral targets. Um, another area is problem solving, and this is a recent article. Again, this is, uh, there isn't as rich a literature here, but what there is is very interesting. So uh, this particular study involves the remote association test. So I don't know if you've ever heard of this test. The way it works is you give uh, the subject three words, and the three words are all linguistically related, or they have some, some word that ties them all together. It's the kind of thing you might see in a game show, frankly. So, so for example, for the words scan, wash, and child, if you think about that for long enough, you might think, ah, brain unites those three words. There's, uh, you can have a brain scan, you can be brainwashed, you could have a brain child. You know? so, so that's the nature of the task. And what they found was that, um, that if you administer transcranial direct current stimulation over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you're more likely, significantly more likely, to be able to come up with the right solutions, the right creative solutions for these uh, remote associations, which are actually quite difficult problems. 
And then finally, I want to focus on what has been uh, popular in the lay literature and has been referred to as savant skills. And this actually focuses on the work, what I'm going to focus on in the next two slides, the work of uh, one investigator in particular, Alan Snyder, who's uh, made the claim that you can actually unmask savant-like skills in normal individuals using uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so um, in uh, one study that I think is, is pretty controversial amongst uh, cognitive neuroscientists, he, uh, which, for which I actually gave you the New York Times sort of lay coverage of this article because I wanted to emphasize how much press it's gotten. Um, he felt that he induced improved drawing skills in, uh, in four out of 11 subjects after receiving 10 minutes of transcranial magnetic stimulation. So what you see, and this is uh, stimulation of the left anterior temporal lobe, sort of low frequency inhibitory stimulation. Now, I have to say that I myself am not that impressed by what he calls improvement or his examples of improvement in the drawings. And so the controls are a little bit questionable. But um, he also goes on to suggest that some of the subjects show an improved proofreading, although it's a relatively low number. Um, but interestingly, also, increased numerosity judgments in a large number of these subjects. In other words, you, as some savants are able to do, you show these people a large number of targets on a screen, more than they could possibly count in the period of time allotted to them, and then they have to estimate how many were there. It turns out that that sort of numerosity guessing was improved by um, TMS of the anterior, uh, left anterior temporal lobe. And so his hypothesis is that you know, the, the left anterior temporal lobe has a lot to do with semantic processing and that there's a lot of, uh, of pre-processing that sort of happens. You're, you're conditioning your information that you're receiving with things that you already know and sort of uh, fitting it all into semantic categories and networks. And if you could just get rid of that sort of filtering step, you might have more access to the, the raw lower order information. Whether or not that's, that's so or not, I mean, it's, it's not an... Uh, completely unreasonable hypothesis. Uh, you know, he likens it to uh, situations where you're asked to reproduce things without having a, a full schema of what you're reproducing. For example, if you're asked to draw something upside down, you find that uh, unless you're a very good artist, you're actually usually better to draw something upside down than you are right side up because um, you, the, the theory there is, yeah, this is, this is a normal artist, a normal person trying to draw something up this figure upside down and right, right side up. The idea being that uh, some, your, your preconceived notions about how things should look actually interfere with your ability to copy what you're seeing. And so that's the, the fundamental idea here, that this sort of preconceived knowledge is being down-regulated, allowing you a sort of more pure percept. So here's his data on numerosity. You can see that one hour uh, after, t or that after TMS, um, subjects had increased judgments of numerosity compared to, uh, to an hour later or before TMS or to sham. Moving on, TMS has also been used for mood enhancement. Uh, I know this isn't a clinical discussion. However, uh, I should say that, that uh, depression is the one indication for which uh, the FDA has approved TMS clinically and for which it's, it's now being used officially clinically. Uh, that there was a large randomized control trial, 23 sites, a reasonable number of subjects that demonstrated that there was a much lower um, rate, or sorry, a much higher remission rate of depression. In other words, the depression went away in a higher proportion who received TMS compared to sham, um, and that a fair number of them responded, a uh, um, uh, significantly higher number than uh, responded to sham treatment. And so it was approved in July of, of 2008. I just want to emphasize, however, before we move on, that the, the mechanisms by which they think this has its effect aren't necessarily unique to depressed patients, right? So you can imagine that, uh, that TMS could be used for mood enhancement uh, in normal individuals. And in fact, one of the early side effects that was found for TMS, it's been shown to, to uh, when stimulating over the, the prefrontal cortex or certain frequencies, induce crying behavior and dysphoria potentially. And so you know, there are mood-related effects that you can induce in normal individuals, which is germane to a discussion of the possible ethical implications of the, of the um, technology. So it's currently being investigated for other types of mental illness. As, and uh, also TDCS is being explored for depression. And I just wanted to show you this. This is actually the commercial brochure for a company that is now marketing TMS as a therapy for depression. Right? So their, their name is Neurostar, and this is their, their uh, proprietary unit. And basically, they have these centers all over the country, somewhere between 25 and 30 of them. And they're, they're taking the customers and people paying hand over fist to, uh, to have their depression treated. So finally, social cognition. Um, 
it, I find this interesting from an ethical perspective in a couple different ways. It's sort of uh, meta interesting in that uh, TMS and TDCS have been used to explore concepts like bias, prejudice, altruism and self-interest and deception. Um, they can also potentially be used to manipulate these constructs. Right? So in talking about this, we, we have to talk not only about the ability of TMS to investigate these constructs, but also to manipulate them and what potential ramifications that might have. So for example, um, here's an example from uh, a uh, collaborator with Alvaro Pascual Leone in the, at uh, Harvard. So um, this is an example of altruistic punishment. So this is a, a game called the ultimatum game, where there are proposers and respondents. A uh, proposer proposes to split some amount of money with you, like, a 20, uh, like $20, right? And the proposer makes one proposal. The responder can either take it or leave it, all right? So if you think about this from a rational point of view, uh, if the proposer proposes anything, the responder should take it, right? Because, because it, either they get what the proposer proposes or they get nothing. Oh, by the way, I should mention if the proposer refuses, if the responder refuses, neither of them get anything. Right? So, so it's in the proposer's best interest to propose something the responder will accept. It's in the responder's interest to accept a good value. Um, however, it turns out that, that most of us will actually respond by rejecting an offer if the offer is less than about 75% of, or, or it's less than about 25% of the total. In other words, uh, we would rather punish the other individual for their not offering us enough than to, to get anything. And people will do this with amounts that exceed three times their income. Okay? And so, uh, there's, there's, uh, so th this involves some ideas of fairness, equity, reciprocity, and self-interest, where you're, you're sort of putting your self-interest to the side in order to, to uh, enforce these notions of, of fairness. Um, fMRI data suggests that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is activated when the situation, uh, selectively, more, uh, when the situation is more unfair. If you administer TDCS or TMS, and there are a couple of studies, so if you administer TMS to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex prior to this task, what you find is that people are more able to, or, or are less willing to put aside their self-interest for the sake of, of this altruistic punishment. In other words, they're much more likely to take the offer. Right? They'll take lower offers, they'll take them faster. Um, and that's been shown both in individuals with TMS and also in large groups. Uh, of people playing a, a game, like an, econo an economy game, using TDCS. Uh, TMS has also been explored in, and TDCS in the, um, the, the mechanisms of deception. And uh, there are thoughts out there on whether or not these technologies could potentially someday be used for lie detection. So for instance, um, I should explain what a motor evoked potential, an MEP, is. If you stimulate over the motor cortex, you get a motor response. Right? You, can, you get the response of the hand or whatever part of the motor cortex you're stimulating. You can record that. And that actually will vary with different excitation states of your cortex. Okay? And so a number of studies looking at MEPs study whether or not some type of activity or another actually manipulates or, or increases the baseline excitability of the, the motor cortex and results in differences in MEPs. And what has been shown is that you have greater TMS-induced MEPs for deceitful responses, actually on both sides, than you do for uh, truthful responses. Uh, TDCS has been used in conjunction with a behavioral task known as the guilty knowledge test, where it's applied to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The way this task works is uh, a subject has to indicate, you know, that you, you show them cards with pictures, and they, they're asked, you know, what the, the, whether or not it, the picture contains this or that, and on the, the subject is indicated whether or not they should tell the truth or not. And so sometimes they tell the truth, sometimes they lie. Uh, it turns out that if you apply TDCS over the dorsolateral pre prefrontal cortex, it selectively increases the response time when they're lying, right? So it sort of teases out the false response from the true responses. So you know, we talked about a number of ways in which TMS and TDCS can either alter or enhance uh, cognition, emotion, or ways in which it can be used to explore uh, ethical concepts and constructs. So you know, are we, is, is it full steam ahead? Are we on to you know, a brave new world where we can all go to spas and get tuned up cognitively and sort of get our emotional tone uh, ratcheted up if we're feeling a little run down or, or uh, you know, train our kids to be more ethical by stimulating them you know, and, uh, so they don't lie as well. You know, it, it, are we on the road to that? 
Well, uh, before I say anything else, I want to acknowledge someone else who um, does a lot of work in this area. You have one of his articles in your readings, Anjan Chatterjee, who um, gave me a lot of feedback. You know, it's nice, it's refreshing, like I said, for me to sort of step outside my normal role of administering TMS and sort of think about its broader implications. Um, Anjan's pretty seminal in the area of cosmetic neurology, and uh, I think that a lot of the principles that he's elucidated apply to thoughts about TMS and TDCS. So let's talk a little about those potential perils. They include safety, issues of uh, character, what makes ourselves, what makes us ourselves, and what makes our lives worth living, uh, justice, and autonomy. So first of all, safety. In some ways, safety is the most concrete of these concerns. And um, you know, when you're talking about TMS, again, I'll say no one's ever demonstrated anything unsafe regarding TDCS, so I'm going to focus on TMS here. There are some known risks, the main one being seizure induction. Right? So outside of standard parameters, outside of acceptable parameters, it is possible to induce a seizure using TMS. But guidelines are now published, and when we follow them, uh, there have been no reported cases of seizures in normal individuals. The, most of these other concerns are, uh, have either been uh, mitigated relatively easily. For example, uh, changes in hearing uh, can be c countered by using earplugs and things like that. Most of them are, are easy fixes. Um, and uh, like I said, if we stay within parameters, seizure induction isn't too much of a problem. But sort of more importantly, th this problem is, you know, while it's obviously important, it, it's not like it's a completely alien problem to us. It's a familiar problem to us. Because in the field of medicine, uh, you know, if you're talking about any kind of therapeutic intervention, you, you have to think about safety. And so there, there is a sort of a, a large infrastructure, uh, both physically and also sort of conceptually and mentally and ethically around the idea of how you bring something to, uh, to therapeutic application and think about its safety and tolerability. Um, and so far, as far as we know, TMS and TDCS have a pretty good risk to benefit ratio. So we haven't demonstrated, no one's demonstrated scenarios in which the, the risks of TMS have uh, exceeded, or TDCS have exceeded the benefit that uh, can be induced. And importantly, one of the reasons why this issue is sort of a, a, a shallow problem uh, in other words, it's not a, a conundrum, is that you know, there's really no conflict of interest here. If TMS or TDCS were to be used therapeutically or for enhancement purposes, everyone is uh, sort of, it's in everyone's best interest for the, the technology to be safe. It's not in MagStim's interest for the technology to be dangerous and to hide it from you, or, or, or in the practitioner's interest to, uh, to administer an unsafe technology. So there are no conflicts of interest there. So let's talk a little bit about justice. Again, this is sort of a familiar problem if you're talking about any kind of therapy. And that is that you may not have the equitable distribution of a resource. Right? So um, you might imagine that if someone can pay out of pocket in order to get amped up, you know, get their, their emotions improved a little bit, a little brighter disposition, or maybe when they're studying for that, uh, that test in French, if they could learn to distinguish uh, the fake grammar from real grammar, you know, you might imagine a future of, uh, of boutique cognitive clinics where uh, enhancement is for the wealthy only, right? Something that other people just don't have access to. Um, again, this problem is problematic. Uh, however, it mirrors already existing problems. So it doesn't introduce a new sort of category of problem. And interestingly, as we were thinking about it, it may one day be the case that, that brain stimulation is uh, a little bit less problematic than some expensive therapies when it comes to what can be administered in the equitable distribution. Remember, TDCS, this portable unit, costs ten thousand dollars. It's got no operation cost other than the electricity in the room. And so, you know, in that respect, it's not like an MRI or a PET scan or uh, you know some advanced chemotherapy or some other uh, heroic measure. So it, it may have may be plagued by less of these problems of, um, of high cost as they relate to inequity. And then there's the slightly more uh, amorphous or, or sort of harder to put your finger on question of character. And by this I'm talking about issues of identity and what we think gives our lives some meaning. And um, what I want to point out here is that Enduring discomfort, or in striving against adversity, if you will, forms a, an important pillar in our self-definition. It sort of worked into our, the makeup of, of uh, our concept of personal growth, as reflected by a number of sayings, which you know, we are all familiar with, which sort of capture something quintessential in our experience, that, that um, you know, no pain, no gain, nothing worth having is, is uh, easy. 
Uh, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. My favorite, which is a marine motto. Pain is just weakness leaving the body. Right? We, it's deeply embedded in our sense of character that, that enduring difficult experiences ha somehow adds to our, our character and our nature. Um, in fact, there's some evidence, neuroimaging evidence, that suggests that when you're watching other, painful, other people undergoing painful experiences, you activate some of the same networks that you would when you're undergoing a painful experience. So in fact, painful experiences might have some relationship to your ability to actually empathize with other people in their painful experiences. But on the other hand, so, so in the context of all that, just being able to zap every difficult experience away might have some deleterious uh, some deleterious effect on our overall definition of, of uh, ourselves and our worthwhile experiences. Having said that, this isn't an easy sort of binary yes-no question, right? There are clearly some painful experiences that we no longer think it's necessary to go through in order to be good, strong uh, individuals. For example, um, child, in childbirth, anesthesia is now debatable still. I mean, there are people who go without it. but. It, it isn't sort of now factored into the considerations of whether or not someone's a good person or not, or, or, or has a, a strong moral character if they want an epidural prior to their delivery. So the, the, the question is then, if, if not all pain is worth the gain, then who decides? Like who decides when that major depression is significant enough that it warrants stimulation, or that you're feeling a little bit run down today because your grant didn't get a good score, maybe that paper didn't get accepted, you know, you could use a little TMS to zoom up. You know, who who gets to arbitrate that? Right? So that's that's a question that needs to be uh, elucidated and sort of thought about. So then there's the question of autonomy. And I think in initially approaching this, uh, I initially consider whether or not people would be free to get magnetic brain stimulation or electrical stimulation, whether they would have that freedom. But I think a more disturbing kind of uh, question of autonomy is whether people will be able to refuse it. Right? And so here, I want to think about two kinds of autonomy, what, what I've called a, a hard coercion and a soft coercion. Or a hard coercion is an explicit coercion. It's where a society decides that you have to do something for the greater good, or else you will be penalized. Right? You all have to wear your seat belts when you ride in your cars, or else there's a, a penalty to be paid for that. Um, so there is a historical precedent for requirements, for the, the law to require you to do something for your own safety or for uh, the improvement of your, your quality of life. Um, and so it's not inconceivable that at some point one might be forced to participate in activities that have a mood or attitude adjusting uh, quality to them. So uh, for example, you can imagine military applications. Uh, you know, there are stories and th there is actually a precedent uh, for military having interest in, in this kind of uh, manipulation. Um, speculating, again, I've never read or heard of this, but uh, if you could imagine that you could, ha you could modulate moral constructs using non-invasive brain stimulation, there would be certain disadvantaged populations that you would have to worry about, like uh, would this be inflicted on prison populations, or, or uh, there's a discussion in one of the articles I gave you about whether or not it would be used in truth detection for subjects who are for, uh, on the witness stand or, for, or for, uh, who are being uh, interrogated for the po possibility of uh, perjuring themselves. Right? And so we're talking about forced mood or attitude adjustment or forced revelation of cognitive states. Again, in that vein, um, we read a little bit about the possibility of TDCS and TMS being used possibly for lie detection, the, the forced revelation of what your cognition is. Then there's the area of soft coercion. And here, what we're really talking about is just the, the, the tone of a, a society, basically the, the overarching theme that we as a modern society have uh, about the value of competition and of constant improvement, right? That, uh, that we have defined progress as a never-ending stream of improving productivity and uh, of uh, improving performance. And in that regard, you can see already many examples where uh, enhancement has been used. You know, there's a strong temptation for it to use enhancement in order to, to get ahead, even though no one is forcing these individuals to use these enhancements. Examples include professional sports, right? We've had a lot in the news about doping. N certainly no one's forcing the hand of these athletes to, uh, to engage in this activity, and there are actually penalties for this. However, the, uh, the zeitgeist of constant motion forward, of constant increased productivity, sort of coerces them into these actions. And you, know, you hear about and, and read about and may know uh, personally 
uh, that stimulants are used among students and professionals now with increasing frequency to try and improve performance insofar as they've been shown to potentially enhance cognition. Again, no one's putting a gun to anyone's head and telling them to take these stimulant medications. It's a soft coercion. And so you can imagine that uh, as this, these investigations go on, that non-invasive brain stimulation might be subject to the same types of pressures. So that's almost it. I'm running a little bit over. The next steps in my mind, first of all, is just to be aware. You know, I, I do a lot of brain stimulation. I know a lot of people who do brain stimulation. We don't often talk about the, the large scale implications of the technology and what it might do to, to society. And so I think it's important to raise awareness of these issues and their plausibility. And then to, to really try and learn what we can from other examples of elective self-enhancement. And uh, so, you know, one common example that most people are familiar with is cosmetic surgery. Another one that's emerging, um, and again, I want to uh, acknowledge Anjan Chatterjee's contribution to, to my thought process on this, is cosmetic neurology, this idea that now pharmacology can be used to, uh, to enhance cognition in normal individuals. And I guess at the end of the day, um, I don't think that we'll be able to make any monolithic decisions about self-enhancement using TMS or TDCS. I think at the end of the day, like so many of these other cases, we'll have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, sort of weighing out some of these issues, keeping in mind the, the, uh, the properties like autonomy, safety, justice. You know, we, those will, will sort of come on a case-by-case on -case individual basis, but something that will be a challenge as we move forward. And I'll be happy to entertain your questions.